So without further ado, I will now invite Barry Ellis to uh, make his presentation. So Barry Ellis has been working in accessible gaming since 1994, where he started a lifelong passion for finding, making, and sharing leisure-based assistive technology. Director of One Switch since 2002, one of the earliest members of the IGDA Game Accessibility Special Interest Group, uh, and he's also always learning. He is an IGDA. He's also a member of the IGDA, International Game Developers Association. So, Bonjour. go ahead, Barry. The fuel that drives accessible gaming is found in us all. It's the joy of play, knowledge of what it is to struggle, the instinct to help those we care for, and the search for meaning. And the spark came in harnessing electricity for play and for superhuman powers. For 1898, a coup phone hearing aid was perhaps the first electronic assistive technology, AT, aimed at disabled people. The 1912 exploring optophone enabled a blind person to hear the varying light around them. And the 1914 optophone gave them a way to read printed text. A trained operator moved a control arm to scan across each character. This translated to a flow of musical tones, which were possible to reinterpret as meaningful words. The British Wireless for the Blind Fund in 1928 was the first electronic assistive technology charity. Radio offered a source of connection to the modern world and of cultural enrichment. Full-length audiobooks surfaced from 1934. One early set of recordings was of Joseph Conrad's Typhoon, and here, the crew and passengers of a steamship try to survive a brutal storm at sea, often in pitch blackness. In the hell of World War II, knowledge accelerated around computers and separately what it took to keep people alive. Throughout the 1950s, innovation in assistive technology was rekindled, such as Emeka Vakian's hands-free typewriter, controlled with coded puffs of air, TV control, accessible from the confines of an iron lung, engineered by a team with links to Bally Pinball, and the Klein electric wheelchair, developed in Ontario and mass-produced in 1956, and patients were included in the design process to provide critical feedback. Uh, and bottom in the middle, the 1957 Ricks communicator, uh, and here a clock hand communication device activated by breaking a beam of light. Stoke Mandeville Hospital, uh, Stoke Mandeville National Spinal Injury Centre in England was the birthplace of the Paralympics in 1948. It was also the birthplace of Possum in 1960, the patient-operated selector mechanism. Originally headed by Reg Mallon, Possum Controls Limited made communication and environmental control possible from a wide choice of interchangeable input devices. They pioneered the use of micro switches, sip and puff, and grid-based communication scan and select interfaces. Possums were free from the National Health Service, enabling many of the most disabled people to leave hospital, go home, and live rich and varied lives of their own making. And these innovations are etched in the DNA of, of modern-day assistive technology and accessible gaming. And possum, Latin for I can, still trade today. Bring it closer. Around all this new technology for living, communities formed. One was with the Respinaut magazine by, for, and about people with residual respiratory paralysis. The name Respinaut came from founder Anne Armstrong's experience of living in an iron lung. Like an astronaut, she lived a restricted life in a tiny space and depended totally on machinery for her communications and air supply. Around 1966, NASA developed eye gaze with a possum-inspired grid scan and select method. They feared that under extreme G-forces, astronauts might find themselves unable to lift their arms and fingers to operate the spacecraft. 
NASA saw the benefits of this for disabled people back on Earth and shared their work. Bliss symbols were born in 1942 as a universal symbolic language to unite humanity and stop all future wars. Creator Charles Bliss only lived to see the system adopted in the Ontario Crippled Children's Centre as an alternative communication system. This is an excerpt from the booklet Secret Symbols on the first year students to use Bliss. In another part of our room, there are five more children. They talk with symbols too, but instead of using their fingers, like us, they make lights point to their symbols. You should hear some of the stories they tell about birthday parties, uh, about outings, about sisters. They are just full of secrets. This is a 1972 Plato 4 touchscreen computer terminal used in education. And on the right, this is Donald Sherman in 1974 ordering a pizza using a Votrax speech synthesizer. The 1978 VidCom was Atari's brief foray into AAC, Augmentative and Alternative Communication Devices, for people without speech. Preset words could be quickly displayed from a small list, as well as slowly spelling, the letter, spelling letter by letter. Text messaging over phone lines was even an option. And in 1979, under the name Telemachus, Reg Malling, who had left Possum, ran the UK's first online disability information service. As for the foundations of electronic gaming, chess matches played across telegraph wires using one switch Morse code started in 1844. By 1897, games bridged continents using deep sea telegraph cables. Games of blindfolded chess date back to the Middle Ages. Uh, Electromechanical games of skill appeared in amusement arcades from around 1930. Cheap entertainment during the Great Economic Depression. First was the Rotary Merchandiser prize machine with low height and simple one button control. Spotlight Golf from 1936 is believed to incorporate the world's first electronic computer with a one byte mem memory store. And this golf sim gave players a choice of course difficulty. Using standard golf handicap scoring, competition could be made balanced too. Public access to computer games started fleetingly around 1949 to 1951. Most, if not all, of these games had easier play options. The world's first commercial computer, the Ferranti Mark I, also had the world's first conventional video game, Christopher Strachey's Drafts. The game featured an undo option, and it also played God Save the King, at game over, as all games should. Millions of Britons played a computer game in the late 1950s that runs to this day. The premium savings bond scheme. It encouraged people to save money while having a chance to win cash prizes should Ernie, the electronic random number indicator equipment, draw their bond numbers. The game had high profile critics at the start. Future Prime Minister Harold Wilson called it a squalid raffle. And the Archbishop of Canterbury said it was a cold, mechanical, inhuman activity. Computer games have always been given a hard time. By the 1960s, there were hundreds of computer and video games, most out of reach of the general public. In 1972, easy to learn, hard to master, underpinned Atari's Pong. Where television tennis was most likely to be found was in the tsunami of clones that followed in pubs, bars, arcade shops, shopping catalogues and homes. Taito's Space Invaders was first to weave video games deep into the tapestry of human culture. One coin, one play made video games affordable. But in a world where one size doesn't fit all, could a player understand the game? Could they reach the controls? Could they hear it? Could they see it? Cognition. The first games console, the Magnavox Odyssey, came with a speed dial allowing games of tennis to be slowed down. 
Arcade Pong received a conversion kit in 1973, enabling players to adjust the difficulty of a game by changing their paddle size. Both features were copied far and wide. Starting in 1978 to at least 1982, Atari VCS games were being used at a brain injury rehab unit in California. It was hoped that games could improve a range of impaired mental skills, and early data suggested that they could be doing so. In 1981 and 82, a special feature label was added to the boxes of some of Atari's biggest console games. This was indicated by a bear symbol with text to convey that the game had easier play options aimed at young children. A range of devices in the 1980s and 90s could make games a lot easier. Slow-mo and freeze-frame devices, when they worked, could help anyone with slower reactions and if needing a break. Cheap cartridges could allow players to make the rules to suit them. And if that meant being invincible, then so be it. Some allowed for game states to be saved, so a tricky bit could be tried repeatedly. And I've included this brilliant computing video from 1987 to convey that there's no such thing as too easy for some. People like you'll see here are often forgotten in our field. The virtue of touchscreen is its immediacy. It's a very motivating tool, and people want to use it. It appeals to a wide age range. Computers can help you achieve your aims and objectives, whether you are working in education, the health service, social services, or as a carer of a handicapped person. The technology can be a powerful tool in enabling the achievement of your current goals, as well as opening up a host of new opportunities. Given the right software and input devices, computers are capable of motivating people across the age and ability range. At Airedale Child Development Unit, they use the touchscreen as their main input. Working with more handicapped teenagers, Redwood Croft School find single switch inputs useful. Joystick games is a hierarchy of games to play with a joystick. The simplest of the games is mousetrap. The object of mousetrap is to catch a mouse by operating the joystick in any direction. We can determine how large or small the mousetrap is. The larger the mousetrap, the easier it is to catch the mouse. So we wait until the mouse is under the trap and then we operate the joystick in any direction. Some games allow for ultra-low pressure enjoyment. Atari's iRobot in the arcades allowed players to forget the game and relax in Doodle City, creating art with the game's elements. And sound test options can bring much fun too. Start and assist modes can help massively. 1991's F1 GP demonstrates many, including an indestructible car option, steering assist, automatic braking, and dotted best line indication. Some games are annoying when repeatedly telling you how bad you are, no matter how hard you try. That was weak. Having that repeatedly is, is annoying. Dancing Stage Party Edition for the PS2 gave a welcome no booing option for those who don't like to be heckled. Globally, over one in 10 adults are thought to be illiterate in a world with over 7,000 spoken languages and 300 forms of sign language. In the US, 5% of children have some type of language processing disorder. Words can be a brick wall. This can be with game menus, speech, audio description, and the sesquipedalian opaque nomenclature of so many terms and conditions. Word alternatives, such as icons, photos, sound effects, and video can help. 
two controllers acting as one allows for varied setups and for team play. It's long been an option for some. The Copilot Xbox feature in 2017 made this more readily available. And in 2023, Apple and Sony are hoping to do so too. Artificial intelligence offers a way to help players. For instance, computer vision can help a player isolate a target and then move in a fraction of a second onto it. If you have slow reactions, this can make the unplayable playable. It's a contentious solution though. It will lead to computer vision assist bots at war with anti-cheat tech and some middle ground is needed. As for the future, the Saab night panel button shows one way forward. When pressed, all but what matters is dimmed. And in this picture, all that is lit up is the driver's speed and the braking cars on the road ahead. Control. Myron Kruger, a pioneer in extended reality, or artificial reality as he termed it, found a way to make the human body the controller. In 1970s Metaplay, a participant entered a darkened room where they would be projected onto a large screen. A behind-the-curtain Wizard of Oz computer operator could draw on this same live image using a light pen. With imagination, there was limitless scope for play. This chin-controlled Magnavox Odyssey and Sitpuff pinball machine date from 1972, and these were used in New York and Floridan hospitals by injured Vietnam veterans. This shows Mavis, the multi-purpose computer, in a suitcase. It gave a test pool of severely disabled children a means to record, edit, store and retrieve their thoughts, often for the first time, and to play with games and toys, to create art and music and much more. This UK government funded approach was visionary but expensive. Pitted against the alternative of adapting cheaper off the shelf computers, it lost out. Modification of controllers used to, be encouraged, used to be encouraged by Atari. The use of an open standard DE9 connector led to a huge choice of controllers for players, including compatibility with some wheelchairs. Adapters were common for incompatible computers, sometimes adding remapping and auto-fire options. Atari forwarded people requesting specialised controllers to a rare expert at the time, Ken Yanklevitz who was advertising his services in mainstream gaming magazines in 1982. But one of the most versatile devices of the 1980s was the Apple II adaptive firmware card. This scan and select example of its powers shows Ms. Pac-Man made into a one-switch turn-based strategy game. As the computer revolution took hold in schools, homes and businesses, a cottage industry of accessible hardware and software flourished. As ever, some solutions could be very expensive and hard to find. In 1984, the Kurzweil uh, voice input system was 6,500 US dollars. In 1987, Nintendo of America created their hands-free controller, which these two French lads are using. This gave access, access to standard games using a chin joystick with sip and puff for four buttons, 120 US dollars plus shipping and handling. From 1995, I started to build custom controllers and set up one switch in late 2002. And here I shared leisure ideas for people using one switch control. I started to find like-minded people. Free games, an accessible gaming shop, a museum and more followed. Pictured on the right hand side are some of the controllers from other people that I link to. Top right is the PDG Team Extreme, approved by Nintendo. Uh, if anyone has one, please get in touch. Namco did sterling work in assistive technology from 1985 to around 2013. They built talking aids, they adapted arcade games for rehabilitainment, and they also adapted PlayStation controllers briefly. A frustration for many was in the ever-growing complexity of game controllers. Nintendo bucked that trend with the 2006 Wii Remote. Many games were made one hand accessible, if you could wave it about, and some featured multiple ways to play. 
Apple's 2007 iPhone saw an explosion of one finger accessible games following years of feature phone thumb games from many others. The immediacy broke a massive barrier for people. By 2016, Apple had made their phones, tablets, computers and hundreds of games highly accessible to one switch users too. For games without simpler control options, other means are often forced into existence. Pictured left is Becky playing Minecraft with her eyes. She uses an eye tracker with iMime, uh, a free utility from Special Effect. The grid-based overlay gives access to all the tools she needs. And pictured right are Nathan and Colin about to battle in PlayStation Tekken 6. They're each using a single button and a one-switch pulse system for independent control over all aspects of the game and all the menus. Microsoft have done much to boost knowledge of game accessibility. They started an inclusive tech lab with resources shared in-house and beyond. They released the Xbox Adaptive Controller in 2018 and promoted it during the middle of the Super Bowl. They kept Xbox One controller compatibility with the new generation of Xbox, which is a big deal. The Nintendo Switch has the Nintendo-approved Hori Flex, which has several very useful improvements over the Zack. And the Sony PS5 Access Controller, due in December this year, has taken a more radical approach. And throughout this history, that cottage industry of assistive technology makers continues to grow, like Akaki Kumeri, BioWave, Celtic Magic, the Controller Project, HitClick, Neil Squire, One Switch, Thumb Soldiers, Warfighter Engaged, and so on. And some ideas for the future. Extended reality, today is so full of barriers, will one day often offer, sorry, one day offer dizzying opportunities, and brain control will do too. Game controller restrictions could go, allowing people to use whatever controller they need cross-platform, but this may take legal action. And CAD-CAM, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacture, artificial intelligence, 3D printing may allow anyone to create the controllers of their dreams. Hearing. Once upon a time, many games were playable by the deaf and hard of hearing. Many games had no sound at all. Some, like Space Invaders, were often cranked up so loud that you could feel it in the pit of your stomach. 1981's Williams Defender had a chaotic soundscape, just like a pinball machine of the time. Thanks to a radar display, the cries of abducted humans did not have to go unheeded if unheard. That same year, Gorf showed how much speech synthesis could add to a game. Uh, it was also very hard to understand. Atari addressed this in Gauntlet, giving text and speech at the same time. The key to open door. As games became more cinematic, they became harder to understand without a sound alternative. Automata's uh, DS X machine was based on Shakespeare's The Seven Ages of Man, and it used a synchronized rock opera soundtrack on audio cassette, but also came with a printed lyrics and dialogue sheet for alternative access. Too much sound, all at once, can be overwhelming. A growing number of games started to add separate volume controls for music, dialogue and sound effects, so you could tone it down. Zork Grand Inquisitor on CD-ROM included a subtitles option for all its rich and varied dialogue. Colour-coded subtitles in Sega's Shenmue in 1999 helped players tell who was speaking. 2000 saw the start of DeafGamers.com, a review site for PC games rated for deaf accessibility. It ran until 2013 when the PC broke down and there wasn't money for a new one. Half-Life 2, in 2004, used more detailed captioning to describe sounds beyond dialogue, greatly enriching the experience for those needing it. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on your way to parts unknown, Reed 
Kimball's Doom 3 CC closed caption mod from 2006 added captions and an optional sound radar. In the middle, a red dot captioned flame gusts, I assume from your flamethrower, and behind, yellow and green dots captioned heartbeat thumps and mechanical step, seemingly two beings creeping up on you. Everybody's gone to the rapture used a visual indication of sound mapped in 3D to key objects. You can use them to find what you're looking for. The answers, they're all here. And here you can see radiating concentric circles are mapped to a ringing telephone. This is a special announcement by the Emergency Measures Committee. In 2021, Forza Horizon 5 incorporated a huge amount of British and American sign language. Where sign language is someone's first language, this accommodation can speed up comprehension and enjoyment for them enormously. And for the future, action captions that try to convey sound with artistic text are common to see in comics, but rare in games. Ubisoft's 13 is one, and perhaps we'll see more. Haptic feedback could be used increasingly as an optional sound alternative in games. AI-supported text transcription and signed interpretation will improve, and quality closed captions could become the norm. Sight. The earliest blind computer games used the telesensory opticon. With this, text output was manually scanned using a handheld camera, converted to an array of tactile pins read through a finger. The user would then use touch typing skills to respond. Uh, touch Me by Atari is a 1974 version of Simon Says with four buttons. Unique lights and sounds made this blind accessible and likely more by accident than design. And it inspired handheld electronic Simon, which is still made today. Getting a bigger television could help. This Fresnel lens uh, magnifier advertised in 1982 offered a cheaper route to a bigger display. High contrast graphic options, as in this simple BBC micro racing game, can help. And decades ago, many programmers designed for colour blindness. Nine times out of ten because monochrome displays were still in common use. UO Poco on the left was a colour matching game that didn't give colour blindness consideration. But Puzzle Bobble from 1994 on did with each colour of ball having a corresponding, unique animation. And Taito must have started to realise that around 1 in 12 men and 1 in 200 women have colour blindness. Uh, in 1981, Scott Adams' VIC-20 text adventure cartridges could talk through a Votrack speech synthesiser. With the Apple II... Oh, sorry. I see no child there are. I see I was put to bed it's afternoon. I overslept. I lie in, in a large grass bed. Sheets. Pillow. My neck looks bit and what shall I do now? Yeah, with the Apple II, BBC Micro and IBM computers and beyond, blind people making use of ever-improving speech synthesizers and screen reading software helped. With 3D sound cards for computers becoming common, a thriving evocative world of audio games formed. Some were fast action games entirely conveyed in sound, such as this driving game from Kitchens Inc. 125, 150, 175, 200, 225. Sharing these blind accessible worlds online included Odyssey in 1996, AudioGames.net in 2002, and on the back of Apple's iOS voiceover, AppleViz, in 2009. Games aimed, sorry, games aimed at the blind and, and sighted are rare. Blindness, a 1996 Italian full motion video mystery thriller, was one. Starring a blind protagonist, it's, it was its holophonic point-and-click 3D sound interface that made the difference. And Regret of the Wind from Warp 1997 is like a Japanese language interactive romantic radio play. Creator Kenji Ino had met blind people struggling with standard video games before, and he liked the idea of creating something the blind and sighted alike could play and have an equal conversation about. 
Sega would like, sorry, Sega liked this enough to secure an exclusivity deal where they would donate a thousand Sega Saturns to blind people, with Warp donating a thousand games to go with them. Uh, in 2003, Taito approved Space Invaders for Blind, another Japanese language game that could be played with or without a screen. 3D sound with sonar effects made it possible to gauge and battle the threats around you. Pin Interactive's Terraformers in 2003, headed by Thomas Weston, was a blind and sighted 3D first person game. It offered a rich choice of options for sonic navigation, including highly expressive descriptions. And on the right, the Audio Quake project from Agrip had similar aims, but took Quake, a mainstream first person shooter, and made it comprehensively blind and vision impaired accessible. VI Fit in 2010 sought to replicate something of Nintendo's Wii Sports events for the blind. Pictured at the Marder Center, Qatar, is a young lad in traditional white robes and headwear, likely navigating audio game menus via Wii Remote alone. And Sound Voyager for the Game Boy Advance 2006 and the Dutch game The Explorer and Mystery of the Diamond Scarab for the Wii in 2012 showed further hope. Under some compulsion from USA legislation, the Communications and Video Accessibility Act, Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo started to include accessibility features into their cons consoles around 2015 onwards. And this included text-to-speech, a magnifier and various other features. And this was 30 years after computers were doing the same thing. AAA games made deliberately blind accessible started to surface around 2020. The Last of Us 2 featured a raft of well thought out features, bringing in blind consultants and other experts to advise, and its prequel was made to, remade to match. In 2021, Forza Horizon 5 was released with blind driving assists. And for the blind and vision impaired future, more mods and tools will surface, more games and more stories, big and small. For games lacking good blind access, computer vision tools could help perhaps one day giving players a running commentary and help to beat tricky parts. This could be decades away. Hopefully far sooner, tiny fonts to become a thing of the past. Uh, this is a quick bonus stage, accessible eSports. In 1974 and 75, Crackerball was a brief part of the BBC children's show Cracker Jack. Two children played head-to-head -head on a Pong-like football game. Each goal won a prize of their choosing <coughs> excuse me, for themselves and for a child in hospital uh, they were given to represent. And this double prizes approach was inspired by children stuck in hospital asking if there was some way that they could play. 1977's Telespiel and later TV PAL showed how alternative controllers and the telephone could have enabled those children. In 1979, the annual quadriplegic pinball tournament at Harmerville Rehabilitation Centre, USA, led to short, a short film documentary called Robbie, and adapted video games were a part of it. Pictured here in 1981 is a battle between Robbie Marintz in black using a sip puff joystick against Les Allison in cap playing a modified Taito Stratovox machine. And machines were supplied free from the likes of Atari, Bally, Stern, and Taito, the giants of the time. Atari were happy to see all and everyone play their games. It was good PR. Pictured here are Mildred and Dorothy competing in old age. Atari supported the California Special Olympics in 1982 and 83 with their free play gaming tents. A proposal was made from the Special Olympics to Atari after they had seen an advert for the prototype Atari MindLink controller. They asked if it would be possible for a range of more accessible sports games to be made for future events. 
Sadly, the American video game crash of 1983 stopped it all in its tracks. In 1986, French Handisport ran exciting competitions using modified game equipment. Here in Lille, competitor Nicholas with head down has just launched a bowling ball using a knee switch. And around him, everyone watches the screen intently, including occupational therapist and accessible gaming pioneer Thierry Danigo next to the Atari. Team play was sometimes needed, one to aim, one to throw. Trophies were at stake and the prestige of having the results printed in their Pac-Man accessible gaming newsletter. My start in game accessibility was in an English day centre for adults termed as having PMLD, profound and multiple learning disability. Around 1995, we had immense freedom to try activities that people might respond to. One game we played was real versus virtual darts. Some players used real darts and a real dartboard. Most, though, used a virtual dart setup using a large accessibility switch on an adjacent Commodore 64. Staff would help with aiming, giving players a chance to hit or miss a target with luck or judgment. Likewise, but on a grander scale, real versus virtual golf was played at the Real Abilities Golf Tournament, August 2000. Hosted at the Pelican Hill Golf Club, sponsored by Microsoft, players used conventional golf equipment or assistive technology to play side by side, uh, shot by shot. And this is Daniel Scott, AKA Batman333, competing in a 2001 freestyle dance mat competition. Daniel has one leg and uses crutches. Sorry, small accessible gaming competitions grew internationally. In Singapore, Samsung sponsored the 2005 World Enabled Cyber Games event. From Japan, motion-controlled sports games spread for those who could manage them into retirement homes and beyond. And between 2009 and 10, Gavin Phillips with assistive technology partners in Colorado, USA, ran two of the biggest, best thought out and most joyous accessible gaming events for children I've ever seen. BCI, Brain Computer Interface Racing, at the Cyberthon 2016. And this event was an international battle of BCI systems with up to four disabled people competing per race. Successfully transmitting a brain state linked to spinning fans, if on blue, jumping, if on purple, or sliding, if on yellow, would see you progress down the track, a sort of brain vib ribbon, if that means anything. Gaming charity special effect of long sponsored, sorry, long supported competitive gaming from people using snakes and ladders online via their iGaze Games website to people like Brandon Fuller competing in elite esports using high end equipment with permissible adaptations. Accessible esports events continue to take place globally across the spectrum of disability. ePara of Japan, Ability360 in the USA. Handy Games in France and many others run or support inclusive competitive events. Permastund recently made the Guinness Book of Records as the largest esports team for disabled people. For the esports future, more consideration to be given to those needing assistive technology, uh, accessible esports in the Olympics, and perhaps from that, a unified One World Olympics encompassing the Para Olympics, Special Olympics, and esports all in one. And finally, unifying this all is the importance of trying to make game accessibility information easy to find and easy to digest. When it was one coin to play a new game, it wasn't much of a risk. When it becomes expensive and needing specialised equipment, it is. In 1981, the UN's International Year of Disabled People converged with the home computing revolution 
it did lead to more people thinking about both. Some found the UN's one special year patronising. Ian Jury, then one of the most famous and most prickly disabled people in the UK, co-wrote the song Spasticus Autisticus in protest. He didn't want disabled people to be seen as victims needing a pat on the head. Some disabled people, like Richard Gorn, pictured here using a head wand, found their own solutions and hacked or wrote their own games. Many teachers, parents, academics and other puzzle solvers did the same and then found various ways to share them. Indies have long been an essential part of game accessibility. People needing suitable games and, accomplish, sorry, and, and accommodations resorted to a mix of trial and error, word of mouth, libraries, support groups, software piracy, computer magazines, books and school. Mail order resources, helplines and computer databases grew and key names include Able Data, Apple, the Blue File, the Disabled Children's Computer Group, SEMERX, which are special education microelectronic resource centres, and the Trace Centres. Sorry, and the, the Trace Centre. The Trace Centre deserves a special mention for their mid-1980s work in persuading Apple and Microsoft to include accessibility tools into their operating systems and for bringing about the industry standard for connecting accessibility switches. From 1989, the World Wide Web changed the course of the world, and some of it for the better. This slide represents a fraction of those who have put great passion and energy into progressing game accessibility online. Think also of all the players, the testers, the makers, the coders, the people running studios, competitions and events such as this one. People like Grant Stoner writing in mainstream gaming outlets. Also the OTs, the fundraisers, the campaigners, the friends and families and on and on. It's a good side of humanity. If I were forced to pick just one moment, it would be the formation of the IGDA Game Accessibility Special Interest Group in 2003 by Thomas Westin and chaired in the early days by Michelle Hinn. It drew in specialists and passionate people from around the world. It became a melting pot of so many ideas and hopes and its influence continues to resonate to, to, to this day. There are believed to be around 70 people currently in game accessibility roles at game studios, Ian Hamilton tells me. In 2022, the GDC dev survey had yes outnumber no for the first time for whether devs are considering accessibility. Still only 39% though, so still a way to go. To help developers grasp some of what is needed, game accessibility guidelines have been made public since at least 2005. Some of the most popular ones today include Game Accessibility Guidelines, Able Gamers Accessible Player Experiences Training, Special Effects Dev Kit, focusing on physical accessibility, and Microsoft's Gaming Accessibility Fundamentals Learning Path, free online training course. Uh, in 2023, there are estimated to be over one billion websites with over four in five inactive. Finding suitable games and equipment can be daunting. The many related charities and on online specialists can help. Audio games, can I play that? Um, can I play that? Game Accessibility Nexus, Nexus, Neil Squire, and so on and on. Some sites have content you can filter, such as Special Effects Game Access, One Switch, and the Family Gaming Database. Even with help, it's still easy to miss really excellent stuff. 2012 saw the launch of the Game Accessibility Information Symbol, or Joypad Rider, used to help encourage people to include accessibility information with their games. Itch.io in 2015 added accessibility filters to their indie game store. It could be something of a lucky dip as regards accurate results. Microsoft in 2021 and Sony in 2023 have happily followed. One day, AI search engines may make it all a lot easier, but currently it's not good and the human touch is far superior. Sorry. And for the future, the GPII, the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure idea, holds great potential. And the concept is of an inclusive, sorry, an in, of individual accessibility profiles stored in the cloud and applied when a person needs to use any public computer. This might be a ticket machine, in-flight entertainment or banking machines. Whatever it is, it would automatically adapt to fit around the accessibility needs of the individual. 
Could this idea expand to include an accessibility passport for video games? No need to keep telling each game what accessibility settings you would prefer. It would just know and adapt. Cross-platform cross -platform through the ages. Meanwhile, I do recommend visiting raisingthefloor.org and looking at some of the already useful unified assistive technology databases and services. Thinking 20 minutes into the future is disorientating. All of us are buffeted around in a ma maelstrom of rapid change. We cling on to whatever we can to give us some sense of stability and meaning. People are understandably fearful of AI as they were of computers in the 1970s and 80s. The Robert Musil quote, progress would be wonderful if only it would stop, resonates. For some, AI progress would, could be wonderful for those who want to build, share, and explore more accessible worlds and stories, but don't have the means today. But for today, if you can be a part of that tide that lifts all ships to make a positive difference without treating others badly, you'll be doing something special. And game accessibility, big and small, can be this. And that's it. Thank you very much, Barry. Fascinating conference. Um, so we have time for a question now, about like 15 minutes, and then we will have a break of 20 minutes after that. So now the floor is yours. If you have a question, just ask me and I will bring the mic to you. Really fantastic, thank you for that. Um, I am an occupational therapist turned user researcher and uh, closer, sorry. Okay, I'll start again. Okay. <laughs> um, so I am an occupational therapist turned user researcher and as an occupational therapist, my mind uh, naturally goes to personalization since a lot of this adaptive equipment and modifications require an element of personalization based on a child or adult disability or need. Um, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on personalization in the gaming industry and like where that's shifting since we know that games are becoming by design more personalized? Yeah, I, th th something that GPII said that I liked, which was uh, one size fits one. And you, you do really need to think about all this gamut of um, personalization that's needed. And th I th it does go back to the, the that sticking point, I think, that, that there's no such thing as too easy for some players. And that is still forgotten. And that is an area I think things need to move to. People think there's a, there's a, that's an easy mode. And that's, that's ridiculously easy for me. That will do. But it goes a lot deeper and a lot further. Um, so it, it's everything, I think, personalization. And, and people have been chipping away at it since the beginning. But it, it will never stop being the key thing. Do we have another question in the crowd? In the chat also? Anyone? Seeing hands is no, not good. Maybe I can uh, ask one of mine uh, while we're at it. Um, I was fascinated about the uh, all the controllers that you showed and um, all those design strategies that you showed for making game accessible. And I was wondering if there is any uh, reception from the player part about those technology? Do they work? Uh, do they have, is there some feedback from the public saying if it's... I, th I think, I mean, from, from one switch side, sometimes if a controller goes out and nothing comes back, often that's just like a transaction you and I would have with a, a, an online shop. I bought something, it works. I'm not going to bother to thank you. That does sometimes happen. You hope that's the case, but sometimes people are just giving up. So I do think it's important to keep, to, to ask, is it all right? If, you have to be quite brave to do that sometimes, because sometimes people just say, it's not quite right, and then yeah. you have to scratch your head and think of something else. It would be awesome to have some historical traces of all the reception of those technologies and design strategies to see how they work, yeah. uh, all the have work from the player perspective. but. Um, a lot of stuff's lost in time. Yeah, I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, all your photos were, were awesome. They can kind of let us in at what were the relationship between the designer and the players. Some of your images. 
And um, yeah, uh, question from the chat. Hello, all right, question from the chat. Um, so Antonio asks, what feature do you feel needs to be added ASAP or one that has been forgotten? That's a good question. <laughs> I just, I think that, that inf infinite lives, that, that being all ob omnipotent in a game, taking away all the barriers, that, that, that that's, seems to be not that common to see. Um, just to dial it right down low to, to, to make a comfortable experience where you can just experience it. Um, I, know, I know you can get that with some games which are just go and explore, but often something will attack you or force you to do something or someone will be nagging you. It'd be nice just to dial it down and just explore in the game, just those elements. I'd love to see a bit more of that. You don't see that that commonly, I think. Uh, is that okay, Antonio? <laughs> um, I don't know. He'll let me know. Um, other question from um, Ian Hamilton. <laughs> Blimey. That'd be a hard one. <laughs> um, when is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> in the future. Um, I actually have a question of my own for you. Um, so we have a lot of, um, I guess, visibility on what happens in the West when it comes to accessibility oftentimes, um, either on social media or, you know, the different uh, ac games accessibility people that are working either part-time or full-time in, in the industry. Um, we often hear about people in the UK, Canada, the US, and, but there's, a, there, there's ha there has to be, you know, efforts that are, being uh, made elsewhere, uh, thinking about Japan, which is a huge hub for games uh, in general. Um, do you have any either organizations or works that you would recommend people looking into uh, in Japan, for example? The, the Let's Play project is great. Um, I couldn't tell you the, the link off the top of my head, but if you go to One Switch and go to the blog, there'll be a post there with some links. And if there's anything I haven't addressed, just just nag me and I'll, I'll try and send it. Japan's not bad. Japan's got some really progressive people there. It's a very different culture, I think. Um, you don't tend to see people playing stuff at homes. It tends to be in medical centers. But it, it, it's a start and it, it, it's certainly a lot more than you'd, you'd see in somewhere like China. But people are there searching and hunting in all, all the countries around the world, I think. Um, yeah, there's definite cultural differences and some of it's on the back of that we've been chipping away at this sort of stuff. Probably the, the wars had a big big part to do with the fact that we've, we've pushed so hard in accessibility because there's been so many people surviving it and, and uh, just part of our culture, I think. Um, but yeah, it's Japan did good stuff. It's a shame about Namco and the barrier-free department. They were amazing. But I think that sort of faded away when they got taken over by Bandai. Um, but the, they, they were real pioneers, and there's a lot to learn from the stuff they were doing. Thank you. So as far as you know, is there any system that can automatically detec detect the type of disability, maybe like using classifiers and machine learning? And if it's not, do you think it's a worthwhile effort? Yeah, it's a worthwhile effort, I think. It'd be nice just to sit down in front of something and it detects the sort of things you need without you having to laboriously enter everything. Definitely, that would be a good thing. I'm not aware of anything that can do that. I, I know there are games that adapt to the more you fail, the more it, you know, rubber banding and so on. Uh, some people find that frustrating and patronising as well. It's, you can't please everyone. So it's almost impossible. Um, but yeah, I like that idea. Are you doing it? I'm thinking now. You should. You should. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, so uh, one thought I had uh, in regards to the GPII uh, initiative is a lot of games were trying to work towards being more accessible by design. And 
it seems like if you have profiles based on settings, like a lot of accessible games might slip through the cracks. Like then if it is based on like settings, they're activated or turned off or t turned off or on. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you could get around that and you know those accessible by design games being included I th I think, in such a yeah, 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 it's a good point. I think finding those games, it's, it's important that the filters on the stores are pointing you to games that are accessible by design and they're low pressure in certain ways, they're very good with deaf and blind access and so on. That needs to be recognized and people filter through and, and find those. But I know, I know some people have said um, The Last of Us 2 is the most accessible game ever. But it isn't. It depends on who you are and what you need. Uh, and for some people, the most accessible game is the one that's got you're straight in. It's one one button or whatever your interface is, and you're playing it. And uh, you know, so yeah, definitely very very important that the, the, the store filters are not forgetting those games. It's a problem as well for all the games in the past that are brilliant. Who's going to go through and find those and filter those and put them in the stores? But it's a job for someone, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Thank you. Right there. I will be in top shape after that conference, walking around like that. Hello. Hello, Tara. I know you. I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. So my question is actually a follow-up question to the last question. So in terms of putting things in stores, the tag systems that are currently available on both Xbox and PlayStation show when something is available. Um, and if something is not available, there's no way for a player to know whether that feature is not there because it is not needed or because the game does not support it. So for example, a game ha does not have a subtitle tag. Does it not have the subtitle tag in the stores because it doesn't support good subtitles or because there is no spoken word. What are your thoughts on addressing that problem in storefronts? I think a game that's playable without sound would be a useful filter. Um, that then you don't need to know it. But I do think there's, there's a degree of, you know, if it's a game like Frogger, sorry, all my examples are old, um, it, it might still be nice to have those sounds, you know, something ticking down. So you do still need subtitles to get the full effect, perhaps on some games. But um, yeah, I think I think that perhaps the perhaps the tags need to be slightly modified. Is, is my my feeling. What do you think? I'm not at liberty to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> Cop out. <laughs> Thank you. Question in, question in the chat, maybe, or? Okay. Uh, we have time for a couple more. Anybody? Do we have um, any uh, traces of the co-design process of all those technologies that you showed us? Or is it just like they try to develop a technology uh, in-house, in, in a company, let's say, and then they just put it on the market, or th there is always a co-design process involving uh, people with disability when they de develop some of those features that you showed us? I think um, it's everything. But, but if, if one person in the middle of nowhere who doesn't know anyone has a bash at it and tries to make something accessible, they can still do a brilliant job. But I do think it's, it's important to, and also, the umbrella of disability is huge. So it is difficult to get everyone's point of view. So you do need, disabled or not, you do need someone who's an expert to, to point to things. But I, you know, some games only have one or two features and they can be broadly accessible. And some need many more. I, I don't have any complete answers for, for the, the best way to do it. But if you're trying, it's good. But you do you do need to get people testing it. If, you, if you're aiming at a group, then it's good to get them involved early, and it's good for them to be testing it and telling you this isn't really working, or this could be better in this way. Also, if people have lived lived with a you know not being able to play a game, um, playing it blind, they'll have tons of experience of what's good and what's not. And you would hope if they're experts, 
Uh, so it, it's always very important. Uh, it seems trite to say it, but but it's it's a, it's all and everything. All, all all sorts of approaches have worked in the past, uh, but people can involve lots of disabled people and it still not be great. Um, it, it's difficult. Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit of a follow-up question to that one, but um, you know we're speaking a lot about different approaches to assistive technology. Um, are there examples of bad approaches or things that you know aren't the right way um, to approach accessibility? I think when something works well and you're more interested in reinventing the wheel to look like you're doing something new and exciting, that doesn't always work, it can do, um, but, but certainly I think it's good to learn from, it's good to learn from stuff that has worked really well in the past. I think um, stuff like the uh, Microsoft with the Xbox adaptive controller, that, they, that was sitting on a lot of prior work that, w that has been really effective for people. So I do think it's wise to at least not rule out something just because it's a bit boring because someone's done it before. Because um, th the wheel works, doesn't it? Thank you very much for uh, the conference. Uh, did you, do you see some parallels between the, the evolution of the, the accessibility for video games and the social discourses about uh, disabilities and so on? Yeah, I think, I think things did move on a bit from 1981 with that United Nations. A lot, a lot more people were thinking about it. There were a lot more, it does help to have a lot of academics chipping away as well because it did, the schools were massive for accessibility and all of that long history of people campaigning to get inclusive education made a massive difference for, for where we, we wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for those people pushing for inclusive education because that's where so much technology came from from a lot of teachers and parents and people like that and, and you know we're, we're forever in their debt um, so that it made a difference and also it's just it's just basic isn't it children like like playing what the, the other children are playing they, they like to be involved and, um, and why not so it, it, it was natural and everyone wanted to play computer games as soon as they came out so Thanks. So that's about it. Thank you very much, Barry, again. Deserve a, deserve a hand, yes. And so now we will have a 20 minute breaks.